Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm Bobby Sylvester, joined as always by Mike Tagliere. You can follow us on Twitter at Bobby Fantasy Pro and at Mike Tagliere NFL. Tags, what's up, buddy? Nothing much, man. Uh, there was actually football on my screen uh, last night, so uh, it's like the first step in that process to getting to the NFL season, so I'm pretty psyched about it. I'm super excited, and I'm even more excited about our guest coming out today. Guys, we've got a special guest. You guys are going to love this. Former offensive lineman in the NFL and Ivy Leaguer. You hear him on Westwood One on Sundays. Ross Tucker from the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Ross, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Uh, big fan of you guys. Anytime I can get a chance to come on, I'm excited to do it. And yes, it was glorious. Every time, every year when the Hall of Fame game's on, all I can think of is coming to America when Eddie Murphy is like, last night I watched the most glorious game. <laughs> <laughs> it was the the men of New York against the the, the, the Packers. of Green I, mean, I don't remember exactly what the line is, but that's all I can think of. Son, stay off the drugs. Like, it was uh, it was awesome. So, yeah, I'm, it's fantasy football season, dudes. I got... Fantasy Feast podcast is rocking. I got even money for people that are into betting. It's kind of, it's nice. I mean, we, uh, my guy Fezzik on the Even Money podcast told people, take the Broncos. He actually got the Broncos getting two and a half points. And by the time people figured things out, the Broncos were laying two and a half. So depending on what you're into, um, I got a bunch of podcasts and uh, experts that kind of help me make sure I know what I'm doing. Ross, I did not know you were working with Fezzik. He's as good as it gets in that arena. He really is. I mean, he's the only two-time winner of the Westgate Super Contest, which is really the Super Bowl professional football gambling. So, yeah, he's been my co-host uh, on the Even Money podcast for uh, four years now. And a lot of people that are into betting listen to it because he's he's about as good as it gets on the numbers and the strategy. And then I – I bring more of kind of the hardcore, you know, X's and O's and and football stuff. So it's hopefully a pretty good mix. Yeah, absolutely. And you're hilarious. That helps as well. So Tex and I were talking before the show about, uh, you know, every single episode we have fantasy analysts on and, and we talk specifically about fantasy things, a lot of numbers and everything like that. This is a very different experience because you've got NFL experience. You understand a lot of the stuff that's going on that other people can't talk about. So we're going to pick your mind on stuff that's going on on training camp today. Before we do, though, I want to tell you all about an offer where you can get six months of our Hall of Fame access just with a small deposit. So tags, I always get my friends asking me like they heard in previous years how they could, you know, deposit ten dollars to some website and then get a six month free upgrade to our Hall of Fame premium package. Well, we've got that again. It's for a great site, too. You're going to deposit ten dollars to Yahoo DFS. And I just started playing Yahoo DFS this year. And it is awesome. There's so much different strategy built in with the way they design the salary cap. And so if you deposit $10, if you're a new user to Yahoo DFS, you'll get a six-month premium upgrade to our Hall of Fame package, which is a $65 value. And let's not forget, you can win money with that $10 you deposit, too. $65 value, guys. You're going to get so much with this Hall of Fame upgrade. You're going to get all access to our Draft Wizard. You're going to get all access to our My Playbook. Supports up to 50 teams if you wanted to. You get all of our DFS content, which you can use there on Yahoo as well. Tags this Hall of Fame package just for a $10 deposit. It's a huge value. You got to take it, right? Yeah, it's a it's a no-brainer because, again, you get to play with that $10 that you deposit, so therefore you could potentially win a lot more. Like I did actually last night playing preseason DFS. It was actually a whole lot of fun. Well, it certainly helps when everyone's out there rostering Devonta Freeman and he's not even playing, right? <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> if you want to take advantage of that offer, it's fantasypros.com slash offers. All right, so let's jump right into the training camp talk tags. I know you got a lot of questions, so why don't you go ahead and start us? I do. I want to start right off, Ross, because like there's a situation going on in Miami right now. We have a first time head coach in Brian Flores that goes there. And as a former player, I'm looking for your insight on this one. You know, he has Ryan Fitzpatrick there as the starter. Or Josh Rosen is someone they traded for. Is this like a message to Josh Rosen? But I started thinking, I'm like, OK, maybe they'll start with Fitzpatrick and eventually move on to Rosen. But He's also starting Kalen Balaj over Kenyon Drake, someone that I think anybody that watches film can tell that Kenyon Drake's a better running back, but he's starting Nick O'Leary over last year's first round draft pick, Mike Gesicki. What is going on with Brian Flores here? Is this a message he's sending to the team, or do you think that he's just basically doing this to give veterans the first opportunity? Like, what can we take away from this situation in Miami? 
Well, I don't, I don't know that it's veterans the first opportunity, just in the sense that, you know, Balaj was drafted last year, so you would think Drake would get the first opportunity there yeah. in terms of being in the league longer. You know, he's in a really unique spot, guys, because it's very clear that the Dolphins, they're not trying to tank, but that winning football games in 2019 is not primary objective number one. And by the way, I think they're doing the right thing. We all realize that. I think they're trying to build this for the long haul. They are not going to be a good football team this year. I've liked a lot of the moves they've made to try to gear up for 2020 and beyond. But at the same time, he's a first-year head coach, and he's trying to establish a culture. He's trying to get these guys to buy in to his message. And so it's really dangerous if you're a first-time head coach to go in there and to not play the guys you think are the best guys. And it seems to me, like especially a quarterback, but really every position, it's hard to trick the players, right? I mean, the players know. They know which guy's playing better. They know which guy should be in there. So Fitzpatrick is playing better than Rosen. It's hard for him to not start Fitzpatrick because what you don't want to do is is put a guy in that doesn't give you as good of a chance to win and the players know it. And then they're not really buying into anything you're saying. You're not establishing the culture. There's no level of trust there. So Fitzpatrick's clearly better than Rosen in camp in the early going. For example, they, they have to go with Fitzpatrick. But what I think would happen and will happen is that, you know, after they lose a few games and Fitzpatrick struggles in a game like he always typically does after, a, you know, a, a stretch, that's when I think they would go with Josh Rosen. That's when it would probably be justifiable. But it's really asking a lot of your players, guys, to send them out there and ask them to sacrifice and put their bodies on the line. And then you're not even going to give them the best chance to win the game because you're going to put in a guy who's clearly not as good. So I, my, my guess is they've been impressed by Balaj in the spring, impressed by O'Leary, and based on what they're asking those guys to do right now, that those guys have, have done a better job than perhaps the more talented guys in Gesicki and Drake. That's a really good way to put it. I, I don't even know if Drake is more talented than Balazs because Balazs is just like a bear out there. He's so fast, but Drake was exceptional last year. I'm really shocked that he wasn't there. We'll see what keeps up. Now, another running back situation that's puzzling a lot of fantasy owners. We don't even like to talk about it because it's just speculation. I mean, what do you do with San Francisco? They've got three running backs, Tevin Coleman, Jarek McKinnon. You've got Matt Breida. But now this is what I want to ask you, Ross, is Jarek McKinnon is on the training camp pup. How much of an impact does that have? Can he step right in after training camp and uh, still be involved? Or does this kind of tell us he's not going to be the starter? I would be buying Tevin Coleman. I would be selling Jarek McKinnon right now. Um, you know, the fact that he's still on PUP and just some of the reports you're hearing from out there, it doesn't sound very promising. This is a guy that's already had an injury history going back to college and in the NFL. And, you know, maybe he comes back. Maybe he's worth a late round flyer. Um, I know people, you know, you're, you're picking, you're trying to win your leagues. And so maybe getting McKinnon and he goes off is, is a way you can differentiate in your league. But man, that would be concerning to me. The pecking order right now, in my mind, would be Tevin Coleman one, Brita two, McKinnon three. And I would take a real wait and see approach with McKinnon. I mean, I, I don't know. For all we know, they'll keep him on PUP for the first six weeks. I mean, I, and even when he does come back, is he the same guy? Because you're talking about a guy whose game is built on explosion. I mean, it's built on uh, being able to be explosive and make cuts. So, you know, I always wonder, even kind of like with A.J. Green, all right, so he's back and he's on the field, but – how close or far away is he from really being, you know, the guy he can typically be? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, no. And so basically we're, we're talking about these players that are out of shape and like ones that, you know, maybe on the pup list and behind in the practice schedule. 
What about someone like Antonio Callaway? Okay, he reported to camp out of shape. These reports are coming out all over the place. This is a second-year player. I want to know, Ross, how players like like yourself, let's say you stay in shape all off season, you do your work, you're, you're ready for camp, and then you get there and you see a second-year player come in out of shape. What does a player think about that? Like, Do his teammates think, you know, it's the off season, whatever, or do they think this kid's not really dedicated? They think he's a clown, you know, that, in, in all sincerity, that, that, you know, you put so much time into it that you just realize certain kids just don't get it. Yep. And now I'm hopeful, you know, for him. And there are guys that really struggle when they go back home. They really struggle when they're outside of a structured environment. But when you get them back in the structured environment, they can they can really help you. And so, you know, there's six weeks, to, you know, whatever it is, five weeks now until the season. I think that they realize he's a talented guy that can help them. And hopefully Odell and Jarvis Landry can help bring him along. But there's a reason why Higgins is ahead of him. I think Higgins should be ahead of him. You know, the number one thing in the NFL is reliability, right? And knowing what you're doing because you really screw over everybody if you don't know what you're doing. You know, offensive lineman doesn't know what he's doing. The quarterback gets killed. Even if a wide receiver doesn't know what he's doing, the quarterback can get killed because he doesn't break off his route. Quarterback has nowhere to go with the football. It's a major problem. Guys, guys would rather, believe it or not, play with a guy with a little less talent that that is reliable than a guy with more talent. Seems to me like Rashard Higgins is reliable and a guy they can count on. And Antonio Callaway, certainly physically, and my guess is mentally as well, is a guy that they, the other guys just don't feel like they can really count on. You know, I also want to talk about Le'Veon Bell a little bit. So obviously we know he missed uh, the entire season. What I'm wondering is, if you're taking off an entire year, are you going to come back and be the same type of football player? Do you think perhaps it rejuvenates him, increases his chance of injury? I think fantasy owners are just wondering, like, what do we do with this situation? Is he going to be the same? You know, I don't think there's a really big sample size for us to know, you know, what a guy's like when they took a whole year off, even though they were healthy. You know, usually when a guy has a year off, they're coming off of an injury. He appears to be in pretty good shape. I would tend to think that it probably did not have a, a negative impact on him and that that wouldn't be the concern. My bigger concern is actually the play of the offensive line, which is why the news that they got Ryan Khalil is huge. I mean, center seemed like a, a, a big void in their line and a major concern. For them to be able to convince Khalil to come out of retirement to play, I think is significant. What I, what I think is going to be so interesting to watch, guys, is we all love and enjoy and discuss Le'Veon's trademark patience and how he, he stops his feet in the backfield, which like, they tell you to never do, and yet he had so much success doing that in Pittsburgh. But you're talking about a top three, certainly top five offensive line that he was always running behind in Pittsburgh. You know, if the Jets' offensive line is giving up penetration and and they're not keeping him clean to the hole, to the line of scrimmage, it could be real bad. I mean, it could be his style – might be absolute garbage if the line's not like a top five offensive line. So I think he's talented enough that he'll figure it out. And if it's not working, he'll realize, hey, I got to hit some of these a little bit harder and quicker. I don't have the time to to stop and move and be patient and pick my spots like I did in Pittsburgh. But that's something, you know, I don't know how many carries, if any, he'll get in the preseason, but I am fascinated to see how Le'Veon's style works behind an offensive line that's not as good. Yep, sticking. I want to stick exactly with that subject, actually. That's one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Ross, is how much does continuity come into an offensive line? I, I Like, you know, when you see five starters return, I feel like that's a good thing. Even if their talent may not be top level, it's good to have that continuity, that communication that those guys have. Ryan Khalil being brought in, I don't think Khalil's very good at this point in his career. I think there's a reason he retired or the reason the Panthers kind of were moving in a different direction. What does this mean to the, the Jets offensive line? You know, they have a assembly that they brought in from Oakland, and now they have Khalil going to play center. It's like, 
doesn't continuity matter up front? It does. Um, now, I will say, guys like Osemele and Khalil, they've played a lot of football, a lot of football. So they've kind of seen everything, been there, done that. To your point, though, they are both clearly descending players, right? I mean, they, they are guys that their prime is behind them. And so the question is, how much do they still have left and how much can they give the Jets this year? But in general, I would, kind of going back to what we were talking about with reliability versus talent, I would typically go for continuity and chemistry on the offensive line over talent. It's extremely important. Just think about you guys, Bobby and Tags, and, and how much more comfortable you are doing the show together after how many times you've worked together, you know when the one guy is going to ask a question or the other. It's just a comfort level. On the offensive line, you are so frequently working in concert with one of the guys next to you that so much of it is kind of knowing what that guy is going to do. Um, I'll give you one example, and I think you guys will appreciate, right? So when you know you make calls when you're an offensive lineman, based on who you're going to block, based on what you're seeing from the defense, right? So you get to the line of scrimmage, and maybe it's a deuce call, which is a double team between the guard and the tackle to the backside linebacker. So if you don't know the guy next to you, you make that call to make sure he knows it's, you know, what you guys are doing, right? If you play with him for a little bit, you don't even make that call because you know he knows. You don't, you don't need to say it. You know he knows what you're doing. When you play with a guy for a while, you make dummy calls because even though D linemen are not typically the brightest bulbs in the world, if you say scoop, you know, then that guy thinks it's a backside scoop and he thinks he needs to kind of stay with you and you can take him for a ride. So, the teams that have smart guys that have played together for a while, they can really mess with defensive front seven guys, especially linemen, by throwing out dummy calls that really throw those guys off. That's one of my favorite answers I've heard in a while. That is, that's so much fun and really enlightening. <laughs> That's exactly why I wanted to ask Ross that question. You know, having that experience up front, that, that does mean a lot. And, you know, it's, it kind of, you know, goes into what I've been thinking all along. So I definitely appreciate the insight on that one, Ross. So, guys, we've been talking about best ball quite a bit on the podcast during the preseason. And, um, you know, I just want to tell you about an opportunity that you guys have today to win some serious money with best ball. This is my favorite side to play best ball. If you're a fantasy football fan, listen up. If you want to join the biggest NFL season-long tournament ever, if you love fantasy football, and we know you do, then you need to enter the $3.5 million best ball championship on draft. That's right, $3.5 million in real money. It is freaking huge. Here's how best ball works. It's a season long, but with no management. You just set it and forget it. Once you're done drafting, that's it. No trades, no waiver wire. You don't even have to set your lineup. You get your best players automatically started, and you'll get your best score every week, guaranteed. There's no salary caps. You play in a real live snake draft, just like the ones you play with your friends in a season long league. There's no better place to play, and you can draft a team anytime you want. Leagues start every couple minutes, so you can join one right now. Just do a draft and you could be a millionaire in 16 weeks. It doesn't get any easier than that. Join me on Draft today. Download the app anytime by searching Draft in the app or Play Store and join a game in minutes. Or play right from your computer on Draft.com, whatever you want. Right now, all new players get a free entry into a best ball draft when you make your first deposit. But you have to use the promo code FANTASYPROS, all one word. That's right, play a real money game for free just by using promo code FANTASYPROS, all one word, on your first deposit on draft. Just search draft in the app store or go to draft.com and come play for free with promo code FANTASYPROS. So Ross, Amari Cooper changed teams in the middle of the year, and um, we saw him do really well. No, it was... Some games he was great, some games he wasn't as good. But what I'm wondering is, how difficult is it to jump in as a wide receiver and learn that playbook midseason? And should we expect a lot more now that he's in training camp with the team? So I don't, I don't know that it's the playbook as much as it is uh, getting back to what's been a theme of the interview, which is chemistry and continuity with the quarterback, right? Like, I, you know, Amari last year was what, year four for him? He's played enough. There's really not that many different plays. 
I would tell you that it probably took him a few weeks to get up to speed with the playbook. But what really the issue was is he just doesn't have any any time with Dak really working on this stuff. So now they've had an offseason together. Now they can just kind of give each other a look with their eyes or a head nod or a dummy call, if so to speak, right? So rather than giving them the hand signal that means, hey, I need you to run a hitch and go, he can give them the hand signal that says, I, I just want you to run the hitch. But people are thinking, I think it's a, a hitch and go. Or he can even give them the, the hitch hand signal and have them run a hitch and go. You know, those type of things. And even just, you guys know how Peyton Manning and Marvin Harrison used to come out like three hours before the game and throw the ball for 30 minutes and all that stuff. That stuff matters. That that stuff makes a difference. And so I would expect Amari to absolutely take another step this year because A, he knows the playbook even better, and B, he and Dak should really be on the same page because unlike Zeke, they're actually at training camp and they're getting reps together. Yeah, Amari is a guy that I've been waiting to see like that chemistry built with, and it was like him and Derek Carr just never got there. But uh, Dak Prescott, I saw a, a, a clip from training camp, and basically it was Amari – destroying a DB on a route and it was just like I was just looking at the timing because once he had turned around I wanted the ball to be there Dak was a it's a half second behind and I think it's something they're still probably working on uh you, you just want to see that ball come out before that break happens but you know that's a work in progress but I obviously love Amari one of the last questions I want to ask you Ross is going over to the Denver situation obviously they played last night Philip Lindsay and Royce Freeman did not see the field at all uh we know that those two are the top dogs in Denver the question to me is, what does it mean that Vic Fangio is now there in town? You know, is it a completely new slate? I know we know that they drafted Royce Freeman in the third round last year, but Philip Lindsay, the undrafted superstar, came out and destroyed. Does that does not hold weight with Vic Fangio, or is it going to be like an even playing field between these two running backs, like going through training camp? So I think Fangio is the guy that's going to say, and I've had old school coaches that say this, and even new school would say. Hey, you got to you got to show it to me. I I got to see it. I'm going to go based on what I see. And you know, it's really Fangio and even more than that it's Scandarello. He he's going to end up being the guy that makes that decision about playing time between those two guys. But also, they they're not stupid. I mean, they they saw what Lindsay did. I mean, they know the guy went to the Pro Bowl. They know how electric he was. Uh, but I think they're going to probably look at it my guess would be I'm going to call it the uh, the Camara Ingram model where you know Philip Lindsay is Alvin Camara and Royce Freeman is is Mark Ingram if Freeman shows that you know he can do something like that if if Freeman shows that he can be productive like Mark Ingram I think that would probably be how they'd ideally like to use him I'm still trying to figure out who that Kalfani Muhammad guy was last night. That guy, that guy was fast as hell. I mean, that guy had some serious, serious juice. Uh, you know, maybe they didn't need to, to sign Theo Riddick. I don't know. Cause that, that puts a, a whole other fly in the ointment with them bringing in Riddick. I don't know. I would have thought there would be other spots like the Tampa Bay Bucks that would have been a better landing spot for Theo Riddick, but here he is. It was just this time last year we were talking about Philip Lindsay in that light. I mean, because he was uh, he was undrafted. Royce Freeman was the guy. And here we are uh, one year later, and Philip Lindsay's got a 1,000-yard season behind him. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if there's somebody along those lines like that this year. So I'm looking at a team like the Tampa Bay Bucks, where Bruce Arians comes in. He's got Ronald Jones and Peyton Barber. Neither of them really did much last year. Obviously, the offensive line wasn't there. But he brings in Bruce Anderson. That's the only guy he goes out and gets. He can trade for someone. He can sign someone off the waiver wire. He can draft someone. But he adds Bruce Anderson. Do you think that when a new coach comes in and gets his guy that he's more likely to to start? Or is, is, is it pretty telling that he wasn't drafted? Ellington's the guy that he brought in, in my mind, that he kind of, you know, knows about and knows what he can do. Now, he has really been singing the praises of Ronald Jones and says he's going to be a heck of a player for us. I am fascinated by this. The guy did nothing last year and then put on like 20 pounds this offseason. Let me just tell you, and you guys know, you guys have been around a while now, that never works. Like that never, like you're a speed guy, 
that puts on 20 pounds, when when does that ever work? I've said this a million times every off season. Give me the guy that like girly that lost five to ten pounds over the guy that gains five to ten pounds every single time. And I'm gonna be right ninety-five percent of the time. So for Ronald Jones to go from like two oh five to two twenty five. I mean, it's literally impossible to put on 20 pounds of muscle. So I'll just be very curious to see how that goes. Because his whole thing was he was a slasher who had speed. Did he even lose that? But Arians is really talking him up. So um, that that's one of my more interesting running back situations in the league. I have no idea what to do there because Bruce Arians produces fantasy running backs. He's he's going to, regardless of who it is, he says he doesn't need a superstar. And I believe that a lot of people are saying they're going to be the ones that trade for Melvin Gordon. Guys, they don't have any salary cap room. Uh, and what I'm wondering next is, what do we make of all these holdouts? We saw it didn't work out for Le'Veon Bell. Um, I, do you really believe that they are just trying to squeeze the last dollar? Or are they actually going to hold out? It's hard to read. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know that much about Melvin Gordon's agent, but I'm a little bit skeptical there. Just some of the comments he's made, you know, if they're offering Melvin Gordon $10 million a year, and we know that, you know, the guarantee is a big part of it and all of that, but we're talking about a guy who already has had microfracture surgery, who missed four games last year, has some pretty darn good players, uh, I think, behind him, I'm hoping that Melvin and his agent are smart enough that they just take it all the way to the week of the first game and try to get the best offer they can from the Chargers and then sign it. I hope they're smart enough to do that because in today's era with running backs, if they're willing to give you decent money and they're willing to give you $10 million a year, I, I really think you should take that, especially with Melvin's injury history. You know, Zeke's a lot different because – the Cowboys don't really have a backup that I think is as accomplished as like an Eckler, you know, and more so than the Chargers, the Cowboys really run their offense through Zeke. Um, that said, I still think Zeke will probably do the same thing and probably end up not actually missing a game. I know they brought in Alfred Morris. I hope these guys are just pushing it to the limit and then, you know, taking the best offer they can that first week. Zeke's a little bit different because I think that the Chargers are willing to play games without Melvin Gordon. I think Jerry Jones thinks he has a potential Super Bowl team. I'm not sure Jerry's really willing to play games without Zeke Elliott. You, you play two games without Zeke Elliott, and let's just say you lose one of them as a result. That could be the difference between number one seed and losing the division of the Eagles and being a five or six seed, I don't think Jerry Jones wants to take that chance. And so my guess is, you know, he's going to give Zeke a pretty darn good offer to try to make sure he doesn't miss any games. I think that makes a lot of sense, yeah. And I, I would imagine as well that the teams are expecting this to happen too. So I don't know if they're going to uh, budge much. And maybe if the running backs feel disrespected, we'll see what happens. I, I don't think they're going to trade them. I think both teams do come to an agreement. But yeah, I could see the Los Angeles Chargers going with uh, Austin Eckler or Justin Jackson just for a few weeks until Melvin Gordon gets the point. Yeah, somewhat of a timeshare there. Uh, hey, Ross, before we let you get out of here, I know you got to run, but give us one player that's like maybe down the draft boards this year in fantasy football. Someone that you're like, I feel like he's just being undervalued in terms of how people are looking at him, that he's going to have a bigger role than maybe some people expect. You know, it's just tough because there's always reasons why they're being drafted where they are. I would tell you, though, I kind of like Tony Pollard's spot right now in Dallas, just in the sense that if Zeke gets hurt or he did miss some games, Alfred Morris, you know, goes into that a little bit. I'll tell you another one that's the opposite of what you just asked. I'm a little puzzled by the Buffalo Bills you know, having Robert Foster just, you know, as the number four receiver after what he did for them down the stretch last year. I, I would have told you Robert Foster, but, you know, they spent money on Beasley. They spent money on John Brown, and it just doesn't look like Foster's going to have as big of a role as I thought he earned as an undrafted free agent last year. And I would have told you he would be a guy to get, but it sounds like they've had rave reviews for John Brown in camp and a lot of times these teams want to get the return on investment for the money that they gave these guys. 
Yeah, I think that makes sense as well. I, I was drooling when I watched Robert Foster's film last year. I was not expecting to be impressed, but I certainly came away impressed. Regardless, I'm not sure that I want anything to do with those Buffalo Bills wide receivers just because of the way that the Bills offense is built. And, uh, you know, Josh Allen does throw deep, so I thought Robert Foster would be the fit there, but uh, we'll see. What do you buy into these, you know, these beat reports of saying, like, Maurice Harris is dominating for the Patriots. Is there anything to that? Should we listen to that as fantasy owners or is it just kind of, uh, you know, fluff? Well, I mean, the fact they don't have Gronk there, I I think you can listen to it, but it's still going to be Edelman and it's still going to be the running backs. I don't think you're going to get the volume with Maurice Harris to really have him be an impact. I mean, if you want to take him later in case, you know, Edelman gets hurt or whatever, and maybe he can be a player for you. Or if you're talking like a really deep league or whatever, maybe that's a little bit different, but I don't know, man. I mean, I would take that stuff with a grain of salt. Yeah, I think that's where I'm at as well. Certainly was not going to draft Maurice Harris, but I'm paying attention to it regardless, just because it was the same kind of thing with Chris Carson last year. We were shocked that he ended up starting over Rashad Penny. Uh, Ross, that's all for today's show. We really appreciate you taking the time to come on. Absolutely. My pleasure. Can't wait to get tags on the Fantasy Feast podcast. Um, Love listening to you guys. Keep up the great work and thank you so much for having me. Thanks again, Ross. Appreciate it. It's our pleasure. And guys, you can follow Ross on Twitter at Ross Tucker NFL and make sure to listen to his podcast at the Fantasy Feast podcast. Tags, that was a lot of fun having Ross on, man. As always, he just gave us uh, some tidbits that we never would have thought of. Yeah, no, it's it's always nice. And like, that's why I wanted to make the questions a little bit different than we typically would for the analysts that we have on just because being a former player, he has some insight to some things that, you know, we don't as analysts, we've never been on the field uh, talking with NFL players and seeing how things work. And I think he provided some awesome insight. Yeah, it was really terrific. And we're going to talk a little bit more about training camp here in just a moment. And then we're going to talk about who the next Tyler Boyd is, maybe the next Alvin Kamara, Adam Thielen. We'll get to that here in a moment. But first, I want to tell you about a contest we have going on where you can win a signed George Kittle 49ers helmet. This bad boy is going to go home to one of our lucky listeners. And all you have to do to sign up for that, it takes like 30 seconds. Go to fantasypros.com slash contest and answer the questions there. And when you leave a review, that's part of the uh, the contest here. When you leave a review, Tags and I read every single one of them. It really does make our day and if we're doing something wrong we want to know about it so please just give us honest feedback let us know that way we can make the show as good as it can be for sure we're not going to tell you we're not going to give you fluff we're not going to say hey go go make our egos bigger go do something like that no we're, we're asking for honest feedback and if there's a topic that you guys want covered something like that you know we're always open to that stuff so make sure you guys let us know hey by the way that contest comes with thanks to pristine auction they're always doing these giveaways for our listeners. It really helps if you guys go sign up at Pristine Auction. It's free to sign up. You enter the registration code Fantasy Pros, all one word. You're going to get $5 off your first purchase. And again, it's free until you buy something. And you're definitely going to want to buy something. There's so much there. I just got myself a signed Eric Crouch Nebraska Cornhuskers helmet. He was my favorite player as a little boy. And I just thought that would be cool for my cave. You're going to find something for your cave no matter who your team is, no matter who your favorite player is. I got a Sean Green signed baseball too. A lot of people don't even know who that is. But Pristine Auction always has stuff like that and there's great values as well you're going to find some incredible values there and everything is guaranteed authentic from only the most trusted sources again that's pristineauction.com p-r-i-s-t-i-n-e so tags i was talking a little bit about maurice harris which really surprised me we were talking a few weeks ago about who this guy for the patriots could be i said maybe dontrell inman it looks like maurice harris might actually get some uh, some snaps even when you're hearing this stuff though i wouldn't encourage you guys to draft him unless it becomes very obvious um now i do have a couple other questions though we're hearing that Matt LaFleur tags, be ready to vomit. Are you ready for this? I uh, know. He says he wants a running back committee. Of course he does. I I mean, <laughs> should I be shocked at this? No, I mean, I, I, I look for rational coaching, and I, I wanted to believe that Matt LaFleur, I hope that he's just blowing smoke. I hope this is just coach talk and um, that he's just basically setting this up for just giving everybody an equal opportunity. Um, basically, you know, l- letting them know through camp that Aaron Jones, you know, just because you're the most talented running back, we're not just going to hand you, you know, 20 touches per game. And now he's, you know, he's been off the practice field for a couple days dealing with a hamstring issue. And, you know, because of that, it, it it's very possible that it is somewhat of a timeshare. Jamal Williams has shown that he can carry, you know, he's not... He's not an elite talent or anything like that, but he can nowhere near as good as Aaron Jones, but he's he belongs on an NFL roster. He's a quality player. Maybe he's trying to breathe life into Dexter Williams, but yep. dude, I'm so worried. We're going to draft Aaron Rodgers here in the third, maybe even the second round, and it's going to be the same garbage as last year. And I'll tell you what, if, if that happens, Aaron Rodgers is going to kill his coach. 
Because <laughs> he loves Aaron Jones and he's sick of this stuff. Yeah, I well, Aaron Jones to me, I'm, he's someone I'm slowly backing away from a little bit. Oh, ju- man. Just because, like, the, you know, when you hear these things, we have to listen a little bit. And, you know, knowing he's missing some practice time, that's actually massive. Uh, but I had really hoped that Matt LaFleur had learned his lesson uh, with Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis <laughs> from that whole thing last year. And the fact of the matter is, though, nope. is that Aaron Jones can actually catch passes. He's the best pass catcher in that backfield, too. So, I, I still believe in Aaron Jones, and I still believe that he could potentially be a top five draft pick next year. I think that's a realistic possibility if Matt LaFleur wakes up, but this is definitely discouraging and, you know, should slide him down draft boards a little bit. I had him RB12. I had him ahead of Leonard Fournette and Joe Mixon. Uh, I've moved him back a little bit, though. He's just ahead of Marlon Mack for me now at RB14. Wouldn't mind him in the middle of the third, but man, this is such a bummer to hear. And, and maybe something changes our mind here and we can still get a steal, but... It's not looking good. No, it's definitely not. It's it's not ideal. Let's just say that. Yeah, I moved him from a target on my draft board to, you know, we wouldn't mind taking him if he falls to the right spot. We'll see if it happens. So, you know, we talked about the 49ers running backs. I also want to talk a little bit about the Eagles running backs. So we've been hearing that these reports from beat writers that Miles Sanders is by far the best running back on this team. He could be an absolute workhorse. I've also heard Miles Sanders is so good. He might take the job at some point this season. So which is it? This is what I've been saying all along. I've been saying that Miles Sanders will take that job eventually. It's just a matter of time. Now, Jordan Howard and Darren Sproles are not going to go away. Um, It's always going to be a timeshare, but he is going to be the one that you want in that offense. It's just you might not get it right away. He may not be in week one. He might be that guy that's getting, you know, seven to ten touches. And it's like slowly works up to where he's getting 13 to 15. And that's fine. I mean, we could find usable performance in 13 to 15 touches. But again, it's going to be really difficult um, to to draft him and trust him as a starter. He's like someone that ideally you would have on your bench. But, you know, if this hype picks up in the preseason, he's going to start going inside the top 32 running backs or something like that. So he's probably going to go off the radar um, for me if if he moves inside that range. Because, again, in the beginning of the year, he's not going to have that big of a role. And you might find yourself a good trade if you don't land him. You know, maybe the guy that does draft him early, he may trade him to you after the first couple of weeks. And that's actually not a bad guy to target. I can tell you that right now. I've got him RB39. I've got Jordan Howard RB49. And it's not that I don't think the the Philadelphia running backs are going to produce. I just think it's four running backs are going to produce and no single one is going to be great. There's a lot of guys I really respect in the industry though. Jake Seeley. I saw Evan Silva retweeted something. Um, so, so maybe it's implying that he likes Miles Sanders. I can't be sure. Josh ADHD, a very good best ball player with a lot of great analytics. Um, all these guys are really excited about Miles Sanders thinking he's going to break the Doug Peterson mold. Is that possible, or do you still think that Miles Sanders, his upside is maybe uh, a high-end RB3? Because I don't see anything better happening in Philadelphia. They traded for Jay Ajayi, and he did nothing. Uh, that's kind of how I feel right now, and I don't think they would have went out and re-signed Darren Sproles if they if they really felt like that Miles Sanders was going to break that mold. I, I mean, I know that they're talking about special teams, and I mean, if they were pl- if they plan on drafting a running back, I know that they grabbed Jordan Howard before they drafted Miles Sanders, so it's possible that that really means nothing. They, they got him for a sixth round pick, so it wasn't like a whole lot of equity, but. I don't feel like he's moving away from that timeshare. And I mean, if he does, again, I think that's going to be later in the season and you're going to be able to get Miles Sanders cheaper than what he's going to come in drafts. Tags, a lot of people have been really excited about James Washington. You know, he, he's a lot of people's favorite sleeper, which doesn't really make him a sleeper in my mind. But what I'm seeing right now is that Dante Moncrief is running well ahead of him and that James Washington is just trying to keep off Deontay Johnson. If Dante Moncrief is the number two in this offense and Juju Smith-Schuster is on the outside getting all those special, you know, shadow matchups, Do you think Dante Moncrief could absolutely go off this year? Oh, man, it's really tough to say that. You know, it's a guy that I've mentioned. He's on his third team in three years. You know, that's never good. You you, you rarely find a wide receiver that's going to break out uh, after he's gone through that type of stuff. Um, you know, he doesn't have character issues either. It's it's just a matter of teams not wanting him. So I, I have a hard time believing that's the case. I really hope that James Washington can work his way in there because they do run a lot of three wide receiver sets. They want Juju in the slot. So it could be Moncrief and James Washington on there. I don't really... I think Moncrief is more like a touchdown or bust type receiver, and I tend to avoid those guys because they're not going to offer any consistency uh, unless, like, you know, if the Steelers are going into a game where it's like, we know it's going to be a shootout, let's pretend it's the Chiefs, right? Um, Then, yeah, we'll go ahead and we'll say that Dante Moncrief is probably going to have some value, but James Washington, he's a guy that can blow it up in one play. You know, he can stretch the field for a bigger guy, so... Unfortunately, I'm moving away from both these guys right now just because I feel like it is going to be a a little bit hit or miss. But if I get James Washington cheap, I would take him over Dante Moncrief. Doesn't it seem like Dante Moncrief's been around forever? Tags, he's still 25 years old. 
And he's a very good athlete. We're hearing stuff about, you know, there's a connection there with Big Ben, which is the same stuff we knew about Antonio Brown. If Big Ben locks onto him, man, he's got red zone upside. And if they're going to throw the ball 600 times again, that would still be a huge decrease from 675. Well, yeah, Roethlisberger. I think Moncrief could get 100 targets, including a bunch in the red zone. I- I'm interested here. Roethlisberger does do that stuff. He does lock onto receivers. But here's the thing is Roethlisberger, he does that when he extends the play and he finds a guy. Mon- Moncrief is not a like he's not a natural separator. That's like true. You know, he's not a fast guy at all. So I, I just feel like he's one of those guys that he's he's a solid enough route runner and he's good in short spaces and like inside the red zone but yeah I have a di- I just have difficulty seeing him break out this late in his career you know I also want to say something about the guys who were really upset that I had Juju so low in my wide receiver rankings tags do you know what he did in the two games where Antonio Brown was out and Big Ben was the quarterback uh, I don't actually wasn't pretty 11 receptions 112 yards I mean that's an 88 reception pace but 896 yards that's not especially impressive I'm just not so sure that he can go outside against these cover corners Juju Smith-Schuster took advantage of the fact that Antonio Brown was the focus of opposing defense, and I'm just worried that he's not going to take that step forward. He might even take a step back. I've got him wide receiver nine. I know a lot of other people are drafting him as wide receiver six, wide receiver seven. I can't do that. Yeah, I mean, I have him as the wide receiver eight, I want to say right now, and I'm, I'm open to the possibility that he finishes a top five wide receiver. I just don't think it's very likely. I, I don't think it's likely that he passes those other guys that are the elite tier. So it's like when you're drafting him, do you have the equity of a top five finish? We know Antonio Brown's extremely talented we know he's going to get targets as well Antonio Brown and Juju are like right next to each other in my rankings because I feel like both of them are big target guys but we have question marks about can Juju you know take on those number one cornerbacks does that limit his efficiency Antonio Brown moving from Roethlisberger to Derek Carr and that's the question marks and I would take them over guys like maybe like a Keenan Allen because I don't think Keenan Allen you know he might be able to get in that top five, but I just don't think that the Chargers are going to be as pass heavy as they've been in the past for him to reach those heights. So, you know, when you get into that territory, it's like, okay, I don't want to take those guys over Juju. So I think that the seven, eight range is kind of where he belongs. All right, guys, we're going to be moving on to the who's the next segment here in just a moment. But first, I just wanted to remind you all, we've got a Beat Tags draft contest. You can sign up for it at fantasypros.com slash draft contest. Uh, Tags, can you tell them a little bit about it? Uh, first off, this is an unwinnable contest. <laughs> so... I, I, I've been doing my homework and I'm going to spank the competition, but it, we're going to give you a shot. I, and we've done it before where it's like, we're going to invite you guys. We're going to have 11 of our listeners do a mock draft against me. And we're going to see who could beat me, who could actually get a better score in the draft wizard. And um, those who do get a free upgrade. We're also, even if you don't get into that contest, we are actually in inside the chat. We do giveaways. Basically you guys guessing who I'm going to pick, who others are going to pick. They come up with some neat questions in there. Bobby's going to be in there trashing every pick that I make. It's going to be a good time. Unless you pick David Morgan, then I'll be pumped up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it'll be a good time for sure. Um, you know, it, it's always tough drafting against uh, followers just because it's like, they know exactly who I want when I want them. They know who you're taking. Yeah. Yeah. So it gets rather difficult, but uh, it should be fun. Hey, by the way, guys, this is going to be live streamed on YouTube. And even if you're not part of the draft, come watch it. It's going to be a lot of fun. There's going to be prizes given away. Again, that's youtube.com slash fantasy pros. Okay, Tag, let's move on to our next segment. We are looking for the next guy. Um, so we have some examples in the past of guys who have broken out. And, uh, you know, they just give us an idea of what it is we should be looking for. Somebody like Tyler Boyd, who was actually good before A.J. Green even got hurt. How do we find players like this and who could be the next Tyler Boyd? Do you have anyone in mind? Yeah, Tyler Boyd. I mean, the the, the comparison for me was relatively easy on this one. And I, I'm going to go with Geronimo Allison. You know, he's not a third year wide receiver, but I think it's his fourth year in the league. Uh, Whereas Geronimo Allison, they've already confirmed that and he's confirmed that he's going to play the big slot role in this offense. And that's it's very valuable because Aaron Rodgers over the course of his career has has liked the slot. He he trusts Geronimo Allison. Allison has always done what he's been asked to do in practice. And Rodgers always, you know, acknowledges that and appreciates that. And, you know, knowing that the slot I did the study this this offseason, there's an article on Fantasy Pros. You could look it up. It's uh, how much do slot targets mean to fantasy football? And um, slot targets are on average, they're worth 11 percent more than perimeter targets so if Geronimo Allison was efficient on those perimeter targets he may be even more efficient uh, inside the slot and if Aaron Rodgers does trust him more than he does Marquez Valdez Scantling that can really pay off so uh, yeah Geronimo Allison is someone that could definitely be a Tyler Boyd I agree that I think Allison could be that but you know Tyler Boyd was drafted around wide receiver 80 last year Nobody saw this coming. Um, When I watch Tyler Boyd, he reminds me a lot of Robert Woods. Now, obviously, the offense is 
a lot different. Um, but he runs into seams really well. He's instinctual. He finds a way to get open when a play breaks down. And uh, I'm looking down here around this 80 range. I don't really see any younger wide receivers that could do that. Somebody that really interests me, however, is Deion Kane. And Deion Kane right now, obviously we know he's not starting. They've got Devin Funches, who it looks like is probably going to start over Paris Campbell. Paris Campbell's more of the long-term replacement for T.Y. Hilton. But Deion Kane is someone I was excited about going into the draft. Then he got hurt last year when it looked like he was going to have an opportunity. I think if he finds his way into snaps, he could really be someone that impresses. Obviously, we're not drafting him, but... You weren't drafting Tyler Boyd last year either, right? So let's be honest. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's the thing is we're, we're looking for those guys that are potentially off the radar and, and they're really hard to find at wide receiver. Like being completely honest, you should be searching for someone that you know is going to get meaningful snaps because targets can shift, especially when you come to like, if there's a new offense in town, like, you know, like if you're stuck with the same old offense, it's going to be hard to see someone, you know, walk into a brand new role because the offense is what it is. The coach knows what he knows. And where someone new comes in, there's a lot of things that can change. Tyler Boyd was a league winner, though, last year. I mean, over a 1,000 yards, he had seven touchdowns. If you can get someone like that off the waiver wire, it's going to be really helpful. And frankly, by the end of the year, your team is going to be built up 40, 50, 60 percent off the waiver wire. And so it helps to have these names on waiver wire speed dial that, hey, Deion Kane, I, I remember them talking about him. He's getting meaningful snaps now. He's someone I want to pay attention to. And, uh, you know, we'll be doing our waiver wire show every week as well. But uh, I think it is useful to talk about these type of names. Now, a type of player that could immediately be useful is the next Matt Ryan. I know a lot of people want us to say the next Patrick Mahomes. Guys, that's not going to happen for at least another 100 years. I'm I'm sorry. Nobody's going to put up the greatest quarterback season of all time in basically their rookie season this year. So uh, let's talk about Matt Ryan. Remember, he went from usually about QB 15, QB 16. Sometimes he went up into the top 10 um, to all of a sudden the number one quarterback and one of the best quarterback seasons of all time. Is there someone you could see doing that this year, Tegs? I mean, I know that you put the kibosh on it. Uh, we talked about it last show, but I think Jared Goff can be that guy. You know, we're talking about a guy that has, you know, some elite pass catchers. He has Brandon Cooks. He has Robert Woods. He has Cooper Cup, you know, uh, Todd Gurley. Again, if they scale back that running game at all, it's going to it's gonna flow into Goff. And we know that when they've thrown the ball, they've been rather efficient. Again, towards the end of last year, it wasn't. But let's let's be honest. Matt Ryan took a little while to develop. The one thing that we can say about Matt Ryan is that he continually, continually got better as his career went on. Like that's the that's the reason that I don't like Marcus Mariota. Uh, it's it, you know it's the reason like like the quarterbacks that are stagnant in their production, like a Derek Carr. There's, the reason I don't like those guys is because I haven't seen improvement. I haven't seen them continue to grow into a better quarterback. Players can grow as they get older, but if they're stuck in this phase, like they're, they're stuck. I think Jared Goff, you know, year three in Sean McVay's offense with those pass catchers, I just believe that he's continually moving in the right direction. And when you talk about it, you know the Rams are going to be a high-scoring offense. Their defense, I think their defense is lacking. You know, losing Dominican Sue this offseason, you know, they still have Aaron Donald there, which is, you know, he's great. You know, probably the best defensive player in the league, but one player can only do so much. And, you know, uh, Marcus Peters slacks at times. You know, Aqib Tlaib is getting older. Uh, the secondary, there's just some question marks I have on that defense. So if they start throwing the ball a little bit more, Jared Goff can be that breakout star. You know, it, it's not that I don't believe the scenario is possible. I'm just a little bit worried because of what we saw at the end of last season, what's going on with Gurley. Their offensive line took a step back as well. I definitely think it's possible. I pulled up the first 11 games of Jared Goff last year. It's a big sample size tags. You prorate that to 16 games, 5,159 passing yards, 38 touchdowns. Are you kidding me, man? That would be an incredible season. In fact, I would wager to say if that happens this year, that's the QB1. Because Patrick Mahomes isn't going to, we know Patrick Mahomes isn't going to pass for 50 touchdowns this year. He probably won't pass for 40. He'll be around that 38 mark. But if Jared Goff gets over 5,000 yards and 38 touchdowns, I'll tell you what, that's QB1, man. Yeah, I mean that, and that's where I'm at. And someone actually uh, mentioned to me they listened to the podcast that we posted yesterday or this morning, I should say, and uh, they said that Jared Goff is a, is a prime guy to target in fantasy. He he mentioned something about that his schedule over the first, I think, 11 games is fantastic, and then it's rough at the end again. So may maybe it, it turns out to be the same exact thing. Or maybe when he gets to the end and it's rough, everybody's hurt because that happens, or these defenses are all of a sudden crappy. Yeah, I don't blame people for, like, holding on to what happened, you know, with, with Jared Goff towards the end of the year. It's the, it's the most recent thing on our mind. It's natural for us to remember those things. It really is. But then I ask people, why is it that you're ignoring it with Jameis Winston? Because he was fantastic uh, when he, after he was benched and he came back into the starting lineup, 
Jameis Winston was a different quarterback. I, I, I mentioned this on the show before, but he threw, uh, it was 10 interceptions in his first four starts. He threw six touchdowns in that time. He was bad. Okay. He came back. He started seven games after that. He threw just four interceptions. Yeah. Four compared to 13 touchdowns. I'm looking at it. Wow, that's really amazing. I'm sorry. I had to stop and look at that because that just blew my mind. Yep, he turned into somewhat of a different quarterback. He stopped taking as many risks, and that's maybe it was a growing time for him. Maybe it was like, okay, we he ended the season on a high note, and it's like now he's going to be carrying that into the 2019 season. Now Bruce Arians obviously a better head coach, and the, the reason that you want to like Jameis Winston so much is because the pass attempts, I'm usually like of the mindset when a, a new head coach comes in, they're going to change things and they're going to look to run the ball a little bit more than the Bucks have been, you know, and Bruce Arians has had more success running the ball, but when their defense is as bad as they've been, that's a reason to get excited. From the moment he did take over, it was uh, week 11 when he was the full-time starter, six game sample size. He was on pace basically for a 571 pass attempt season. When you've got Mike Evans, OJ Howard, Chris Godwin. That is certainly going to translate to uh, some very good fantasy stats, man. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, Tex, what about the next Alvin Kamara? I was going to say Philip Lindsay, but again, that's just a different type of situation. So Alvin Kamara, obviously two years ago, he was this this young rookie, all kinds of athleticism, buried on the depth chart, got his opportunity and was just too good to bench. And I know we just talked about him, but it's kind of how I feel. It, it could be Aaron Jones. You know, Ross was talking about that we potentially have the Alvin Kamara, Mark Ingram role with Denver, but the issue is that it's not a high scoring offense. Like, that's why it can't be Alvin Kamara. That's why Philip Lindsay can't be that guy. You need to look at one of these high scoring teams and try and find him there. Uh, and if you're going to look for the next Kamara, I think Aaron Jones is that guy. You know, he's a guy that he might not get. 20 touches per game, but he can be extremely efficient and he can be a high scoring running back and a high scoring offense. So I think Aaron Jones is the logical one that I would say that could potentially be the next Camara just because he can offer that in the passing game and he can be efficient with the touches he's given. I'm going to go a little bit deeper and I'm going to give you guys two names because I mean, Aaron Jones is being drafted in third round. Camara was probably what as a rookie 10th, 11th round pick. Um, that's about where you can get my guy, Justice Hill. And we've been talking about Mark Ingram maybe being overrated. He's on the wrong side of 30. He was propped up by that Saints offense, and now he's going to Baltimore. And Justice Hill is electric. Tags, you've compared to Reggie Bush. I say he's a bigger, faster, stronger Philip Lindsay in an offense that's going to run the ball 35 times a game. I wouldn't be surprised at all if this preseason he steals the job from Mark Ingram. And, uh, you know, maybe he won't be, he definitely won't be a 20 touch a game guy. But if he can get 215, 225 touches like Alvin Kamara, I think he could go off in this offense. He's electric. He can break big plays. And the other name is Justin Jackson. Now, this would take Melvin Gordon holding out or getting traded. But I think the Chargers, if that would happen, would realize that Justin Jackson is the primary running back and Austin Eckler needs to stay in his role because Justin Jackson is as good in space as just about anyone in the NFL. He is so agile in that hole, too. He can break big runs. I love Justin Jackson. I'm excited to see him get an opportunity if Gordon does hold out. I like Jackson, but when I look for when I look for like a Camara, I'm looking for someone that may not be like a stallion, like a workhorse, someone that's going to get that 20 touches per game. Like, you know, Justin Jackson, I think he could handle a bigger workload. You think he could? OK, he, he's pretty small. He but he, the thing is, that like at Northwestern, the reason that he fell so much is because he had so much wear and tear on his body at Northwestern. He carried the load like every game, like his body took a beating. And I think that's why he fell in drafts, because he was rather good there. But I'm looking for guys that are really involved on third down work. That's why I, th I actually love the Justice Hill call. I just don't know if I like the Ravens offense enough to envision him having a potential breakout like that. Justice Hill, was that's a great call. Uh, and if you're going to look further down the board, it's like you start getting into guys that are are not I mean there's a reason that they're not starting on their team right uh like you know Tony Pollard I've looked I've watched more tape of his because I was like I really need to figure out if Ezekiel Elliott doesn't come back like how do I want to approach this I think Mike Weber's the guy I, I think he's the guy that would take the Zeke role and I think that they're going to involve Tony Pollard regardless I think that he's going to be considered maybe someone that they they wanted Tavon Austin to be but never 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 did uh Tony Pollard he's not someone that's going to handle a giant workload but Pollard he is a receiver. Um, he's someone that could potentially, I guess, be that Camara. You know, I like Tony Pollard. When Ross brought him up, I was so excited because um, I, you know, same kind of thing. I don't want to see Zeke hold out, 
But I do want to see some of these kids get an opportunity. And I've I'm, I'm been a big fan of Tony Pollard. I've got a lot of shares of him in best ball. If anything was to happen, I think he could be great behind that offensive line. Now, I won't say as great as Ezekiel Elliott, but I think he could be an RB1. Would, would you say the same thing about like a Chase Edmonds? Do you think that he could potentially you know, walk into that role if something happened to David Johnson? I, I mean, I think he would be in that role. I think he would get a lot of volume enough to make him a top 20 running back, but I just don't think the offense is good enough. Yeah, there's going to be a lot more volume because of how many plays they're going to run, but the offensive line is just nothing compared to Dallas. Yeah, that makes sense. What about the next Adam Thielen? And uh, you remember midseason last year, we were talking about him as potentially being the best wide receiver in football. Now, we cooled down a little bit at the end of the season. Uh, the offensive line was just dreadful, and Kirk Cousins was getting smeared. We know he's not good under pressure. The offensive line's healthy now, and Adam Thielen, I think, could be incredible again now I like Stefan Diggs just as much I think he's maybe more talented but who could be that guy you remember two years ago when Adam Thielen went from nobody to just a complete stud is there somebody who's you know getting an opportunity this year that you see has a lot of talent at wide receiver yeah Anthony Miller is the one that I kind of uh, I've gravitated towards and like you know I, I hate throwing around I'm not throwing a comparison there but when I watched Anthony Miller like there there was shades of what like an Odell Beckham type player. I'm not saying he's Odell Beckham. I'm not at all saying that, but I'm saying that the shades of that and a guy that can break separation, a guy that can get open, a guy that's now healthy in an offense uh, that plays in the slot where the, you know, that opportunity in there is massive because he doesn't see top tier corners almost at all because he's almost like nonstop in the slot because they have Taylor Gabriel and Allen Robinson playing on the perimeter. So, uh, and when he did play last year and when he got targeted, he did work with his targets while playing through injuries. So, He's someone that that's why I keep putting him on these sleeper lists because it's like he's attached to that high scoring offense. He's attached to a team. Again, I tell I tell people all the time, the Bears defense is going to regress this year. Stop expecting them to be like the 85 Bears again. It's not going to happen. Teams regress. It's going to ha especially losing Vic Fangio. It's going to hurt a bit. So even, you know, raising Mitch Trubisky's pass attempts, which naturally happens as he's growing in his career, as he's learning the offense, a second year in, in the offense, like these things naturally happen. The defense takes a step back. It's it's not with, out of the realm of possibilities that Mitch Trubisky throws the ball 40, 50 more times this season. Anthony Miller would have a massive, massive opportunity in front of him, and I think the talent is there. And let's not forget, too, that he was playing with a separated shoulder most of last year, which is just unbelievable. Tags, he had seven touchdowns on 54 targets. I think he's very similar. Now, he's not the same type of player as Calvin Ridley, but in terms of talent, I think he's every bit as good as Calvin Ridley, uh, which I think is going to make a lot of people gasp. But, um, you know, the difference is the situations that they're in. Obviously, Atlanta's going to score a lot more, but Anthony Miller, as long as he can stay healthy, he's got a ton of upside. I was going to mention Devontae Parker, again, going to make a lot of the new guys say, I like it. What in the world? Devontae Parker's burned me so much, but if Ryan Fitzpatrick's back there gunning the ball, uh, Devontae Parker's the number one if he's healthy. I like Devontae Parker, and I, we haven't talked about him in a while, so I feel okay saying this. Bring it, it man. You, you do this, because you you're more of the Devontae Parker guy, but I had to bring him up in this in this situation. That's the thing is so many people like dismiss him. So many people say, do not draft Devontae Parker. Why are we basing our opinion on Devontae Parker because of Adam Gase? Like stop and ask. And because of injuries, like he was hurt the whole time. I'm sorry. He's not hurt now. And do not, do not try and predict injuries again. Don't do it. Okay. If you want to knock him down your draft board a little bit because, you know, he, he's dealt with injuries. Fine. That's okay. But don't tell me that Devontae Parker doesn't have the potential to be a top 30 fantasy wide receiver and he's being drafted outside the top 60 wide receivers. He's six foot three, over, I think, 220 pounds. He's a big guy. The Dolphins want him to be the guy. The Dolphins extended him rather than letting him go like a lot of people thought they would have. Obviously, the Dolphins are higher on him than Adam Gase was. That's fine. Again, guys, stop what you're doing. If you hate Devontae Parker, stop what you're doing right now and ask yourself why you're basing your opinion on Devontae Parker and, and Adam Gase because Devontae Parker before Adam Gase, even before last season for th that matter, Devontae Parker was considered a top 25, top 30 dynasty wide receiver. His talent didn't go anywhere. Ryan Fitzpatrick has been a gunslinger his entire career. If he's starting, Devontae Parker is going to be fantasy relevant. Not just fantasy relevant, man. He could be a wide receiver too, and I'm not joking. Uh, there's no hyperbole there. I'm not trying to be that hot take guy. Devontae Parker is really good. He's a very talented football player who's been suppressed by injuries and bad coaching. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick, if you prorate his quarters to a full season last year, 5,800 passing yards. 
Obviously, it's not Tampa Bay and Miami in terms of surrounding talent, but if Ryan Fitzpatrick's on the field, he's got to get his, and his wide receivers are going to get theirs. Yeah, that's basically how I feel about it. And, like, you know, if Josh Rosen was starting, I'd be like, I don't really know if I want anyone. I mean, granted, there's going to be someone here that emerges as, like, a top 50 wide receiver, but what does that really do for you? Um, so if I found out that Josh Rosen was a starter, I'm going to back away from Devontae Parker. Me too. I won't even draft him. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel. But if, if we hear that Ryan Fitzpatrick is the locked-in starter for week one, yeah, I'm drafting Devonte Parker with a uh, with one of my final picks. All right, Tags, I've got one more than two negative ones that we'll touch on here. What about Tyreek Hill, man? I mean, you remember he was kind of buried on the depth chart and he just had so much speed. He could break big plays. Obviously, we're not going to find someone who's going to jump up and be a, a wide receiver one, but maybe someone with speed that uh, could find his way into the depth chart and just be a monster. I- I'm thinking Marquise Brown. And I, I know you don't love Lamar Jackson. Uh, who, why, how could you love Lamar Jackson's passing? He's going to pass the ball a lot more this year. But Marquise Brown, man, he's the type of playmaker Lamar Jackson needs where he doesn't exactly have to go deep. He can just get the ball on a screen and take it to the house. And it's open. He could lead this team in targets. I like him. I do. I, I don't know if I like him this year just because the whole foot surgery thing, uh, how I avoid wide receivers the year of, of foot surgery. But he's the number one receiver on that team, hands down. Like, he's the best receiver, and it's not even close. But... A lot of people are pumped about Miles Boykin right now. You're shutting that down. I'm with you. No, I no, 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 Miles Boykin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I seriously would pass on him in like the fourth round of a dynasty rookie draft. There's people saying he looks like a superstar. Like, guys, I don't think so. Baltimore is where people go to die. And uh, unfortunately, Marquise <laughs> Brown, like I, I think he's Deshaun Jackson type player. But um, if you want to ask me like what player I think can have a Tyreek Hill type impact uh, in, in the league, and he just happens to be tied to a an elite quarterback in one of the better offenses in the league. It's Paris Campbell. He is a lightning bolt. And if something were to happen to T.Y. Hilton, I think Paris Campbell would be a household name. Yes, he would. I agree with that, man. That's a really good call. All right, two negative ones here. Is uh, there a Chris Hogan this year? You remember we were Ooh, people were yeah. drafting him in the fourth round, yep. and uh, he just disappeared. Is that going to happen to anyone? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's going to happen. That It happens every single year. And, it, and if there's one that I would say it happens this year, it could be uh, a DJ Moore. It could be Tyler Lockett, just because like, I mean, and I'm not saying that these are bad football players. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that the targets might not be what people are envisioning. Uh, Tyler Lockett. I think they have too much invested in Moore. Or maybe something's wrong with Cam Newton's shoulder and then Moore would be kind of useless again. But Curtis Samuel's really friggin' good, man. He is. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Curtis Samuel's the number one, if that's what you're saying. But I don't think Moore's just going to go away like Hogan did. Well, that's the thing. Do, they, do the Panthers all of a sudden become a, a pass-heavy offense? Because now it's like Greg Olson's back. And I know Greg Olson's on the downturn of his career, but he's still going to see 60, 70, 80 targets. You have Christian McCaffrey eating up a lot of targets. There's no reason you'd want to take him away from him. You have Curtis Samuel, who's now healthy, looks fantastic in camp. You have DJ Moore, who, again, he's he's rock solid. I have no issue with DJ Moore as the player. I have an issue with, you know, like when we're talking about who can disappoint because of what people are expecting. I think that he's one of them. I think Lockett is someone that I've been going through the numbers on Lockett, and I don't know if I see him getting 100 targets. Because the reason that Hogan was like, and I can't remember, I wish I remember who it was that came on our show last year that kind of poo-pooed the idea of Chris Hogan and said, I don't know why people are buying into this. Because he's never been a guy that's received like more than like 60, 70 targets. And it was like, yeah, I know. But, you know, with all the targets that are gone and this and that. And he's like, I don't care. The, to this point in his career, he hasn't been that guy. Well, Tyler Lockett has now been in the NFL for it's uh, this is going to be his fifth season. He has never seen more than 71 targets. He led the team in snaps, too, last year. Let's not forget yes. that Doug Baldwin was a shell of himself. Yeah, so Lockett, I mean, to see him go to 90 targets, it would be a massive bump for him. Yep. So I think that drafting him, and he's right now he's going as a top 20 wide receiver, I think that, that is, um, that's a situation where people are being set up for disappointment. Lockett was a name I was going to mention. Obviously, Will Fuller, you know I'm not very fond of that. I think he's the wide receiver three in Houston. But here's the one that I think it's going to be. Jarvis Landry. I think that Jarvis Landry could uh, just completely – I mean, he's been inefficient. He could disappear with Odell Beckham there. I, You know, this is one I've kind of gone back and forth on uh, myself and, like, trying to figure out where to put him because I, I was really, 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 really low on him. And then and then I was like, you know what, maybe I'm too low. Maybe, maybe I'm just – like, I backed too far away because, you know, they did sign him to a big contract. He is a big part of that team. I just think that he's better not being the number one option. I think last year they asked him to be the number one, and he can't do it. And I think everybody that watches Jarvis Landry knew that. Jarvis Landry is not he's not a wide receiver you can move all over the field and expect him to do things that Odell Beckham does 
But now that he's going to be back in, in a role where he's going to play in the slot majority of the time, they're going to mix and match. They're going to get Beckham in the slot. I think he's going to be more designed for that. Him and Baker Mayfield, this will be their second season working together, whereas like Odell and him have only had the one-off season. So I, I think that Landry, he's gone from a guy that I was avoiding to one that I'm okay having as my wide receiver three. All right, Tags, last one here, and this one is going to scare everybody. I probably should have put it at the end of the show. Uh-oh. Who's the next Rashad Penny? Everyone knew he was going to start next year. People were drafting him the fourth, fifth round in a lot of cases, and he was the number three running back for Seattle. Is there a rookie this year? I mean, we're hearing John Gruden say Josh Jacobs might not even start week one. He's got to earn his role. I don't believe that at all. But what about David Montgomery? What about Miles Sanders? Should we be concerned about these rookies? Yeah, Sanders is someone that I'm not, I mentioned earlier in the show that I'm not attacking at all. I, I feel like he's not going to th- start the season. I think that Jordan Howard and Darren Sproles are going to get the majority of that. I mean, they're going to have Sanders mixed in for sure, but it's going to be in a, in a timeshare role. So that could de- Miles Sanders is definitely one that I would put in that conversation. David Montgomery, it's a little different. Montgomery, the Bears didn't need to draft a running back, but they did. Maybe they just couldn't pass him Montgomery because he's so talented, but they love Mike Davis. You know what makes me so mad, Bobby, is that when I have people call me a Bears homer and I can legitimately point back to articles before players were on the Bears, like David Montgomery, that I really did like. And then it's like, now he's drafted by the Bears. And now it's like, oh, you like him because he's the Bears. No, I'm actually, I thought it was actually a pretty bad draft pick in terms of like what they what they could have done with that pick. Um, just because I think Mike Davis is, very, is sufficient. And I think Mike Davis is one of the steals of drafts right now because he could potentially earn more work than people think. And if something happened to Montgomery or you know, Mike Davis is the starter, um, then obviously, you know, there's a lot, a lot to discuss there, but David Montgomery as a, is it possible that he doesn't have the the workload to, to warrant his top 25 running back price? Yeah. I mean, he could disappoint. I think that it's Miles Sanders though, is the one that I know for sure. He's not going to get the touches that people think or expect, uh, at the start of the season. I already mentioned Mark Ingram. I'm a little bit worried about him. I'm also worried a little bit about Damian Williams, who's already dealing with the hammy issue. We'll see what happens there. I mean, he's the starter probably if if he is healthy, but we'll see if he is healthy. And then the last one I want to mention is Lamar Miller. I know Lamar Miller is the starter right now, but if Melvin Gordon's getting traded, he's going to Houston. And if Melvin Gordon gets traded to Houston, he's the starter, and Lamar Miller's an afterthought. That would be interesting. Melvin Gordon going to that offensive line, I don't think he'd be very happy. (laughs) (laughs) where where would you draft him because I agree I I would draft him behind Le'Veon Bell yeah I'm with you there um he'd probably be honestly probably right where I have him right now right behind Dalvin Cook okay so you have him RB 13 um no I have Dalvin Cook at uh, 10 I would take Melvin Gordon in front of Aaron Jones yeah I've got Melvin Gordon right now at seven because I think he's gonna play I don't think he's gonna miss any games but uh I would move him back to RB 11 behind James Conner and Le'Veon Bell yeah that's fair All right, man, that's all for today's show. That was a lot of fun. It's always always good talking to Ross, isn't it? Absolutely. I think it was a different show. It was really different than, you know, like, well, especially the first half of the show. It was different than usual, and that's a good thing. Like, getting some variety in there, talking to a former NFL player is always fun, and finishing up talking about some players that could potentially be breakout stars. What could be better than that on a Friday? That's right. And especially one as smart as Ross. He was an Ivy League guy, man. (laughs) He makes me feel dumb. (laughs) <laughs> all right guys remember to sign up for the signed george kittle helmet giveaway at fantasypros.com slash contest and make sure to check out pristine auction and what they have for you you're going to find something that you love there's going to be some good values and remember everything's guaranteed authentic from only the most trusted sources if you want five dollars off just enter in the registration code fantasy pros all one word at pristine auction.com it lets them know that we sent you that way we can keep doing these type of giveaways as well and make sure to sign up for the beat tags contest at fantasypros.com slash draft contest Also, we've got that offer right now where you can get a six-month Hall of Fame package. It's a $65 value. If you just deposit $10 to Yahoo DFS as a first-time user, if you want to take advantage of that offer, it's fantasypros.com slash offers. And then finally, guys, I want to remind you all that you can get a free entry into a best ball draft at draft.com or by searching draft in the App Store if you enter the promo code FANTASYPROS. Again, that's draft.com or search draft in the App Store and enter the promo code FANTASYPROS for a free entry. For Mike Tagliere and Ross Tucker, I'm Bobby Sylvester. Thanks for listening and enjoy your football.